Good afternoon. Thank you for today's webinar, Increasing Access to Green Space Where It's Needed Most. My name is Rachel Felber, and I am the Communications Director here at the Chesapeake Bay Program with the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay. Um, I would like to invite our three panelists just if they could turn their camera on quickly as we introduce them so folks can say hello, and then we will go ahead and get started. Great. So first, I'd like to introduce Bianca Boggs, an associate with Skio Solutions, where she contributes to creating sustainable communities, revitalization efforts, utilizing GIS tools, and climate change solutions. Next, we have John Griffin, who is the program manager for the Chesapeake Conservation Partnership, where he works to advance large landscape conservation initiatives in the Chesapeake Bay watershed by convening diverse multidisciplinary stakeholders. And Phyllis Joris, who's the executive director of Neighborspace Baltimore County, where its mission speaks to several of her passions, community, the outdoors and equity. And she's excited to dedicate her time and energy to making those a reality. Just a couple of quick housekeeping items. This is being recorded today. You all are on mute. And we do encourage you to please ask questions. Uh, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Questions will come in and we will answer them during the question and answer period of the webinar. And the recording will be made available on the Chesapeake Bay Program's YouTube site approximately 48 hours after today's session. And we will be sending out an email afterwards with that information as well. So with that, I will pause and I will go ahead and turn this over to John, I believe is gonna start off and then over to Bianca. I'm very excited to be part of this webinar and I wanna give you a little background on how we arrived at this Green Space Equity Mapper. Uh, <clears throat> this mapping tool was a recommendation in the draft uh, Chesapeake Conservation Partnership uh, public health, green space, and equity plan, and uh, uh, and we developed that plan as a result of four virtual sessions we held in the fall of 2020 all over the watershed, uh, engaging community leaders and conservation uh, members, partners, uh, to explore these interrelated topics of um, public health, green space, and equity and receive a lot of recommendations, which we fashioned into a draft plan. Uh, <clears throat> um, and we received a Chesapeake Bay Implementation Team grant to fund this work with SCIO. Make the first slide. And next slide, sorry. I just wanna highlight a couple of these bullets. It's pretty busy. Uh, the first bullet um, gives you a summary of what this um, mapping tool provides, um, and um, and then the the fourth bullet down there, if you're counting, it's the first mapping tool to our knowledge in the watershed, Chesapeake Bay watershed, that combines uh, underserved communities with their accessibility green space, um, <clears throat> and it's a very thanks to scale, very user friendly, publicly available website requiring no particular GIS or software experience. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I wanna to call to your attention the first and the last two bullets. The first bullet is we're hoping that this mapping tool will be used around the watershed to increase green spaces under represented communities by prioritizing funding acquisition and restoration of green spaces. And we also hope through that to improve uh, community uh, togetherness, cohesion, and increased quality of life. Uh, so that's kind of a quick overview. Uh, if I might, I just wanted to give Bianca Boggs and, and her uh, partner, uh, if she's listening in, um, a great thank you for the great work you did on this. And we this work included a large advisory committee and listening sessions in the three states of Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Maryland. So with that, Bianca. Yes, absolutely. Let me share my screen here. All 
Alrighty, so I'll just take some time to do the thank you, John, for that for that overview mm -hmm. and for the, the shout out. I appreciate it. Um, and so yeah, like John said, this was a, approximately a year, year and a half of a process where um, we had used our, our steering committee. We utilized um, three different listening sessions with community groups and community members to get their input and feedback. Um, and we ultimately came to developing this um, web-based uh, mapping application. Um, like John said, it's it's online, publicly available, no prior um, GIS knowledge or software is needed to access this tool. Um, and so, yeah, we'll just do a very brief walkthrough of the web page where the tool lives um, and then a demo of the, the application itself. And so the web page that I'm currently on is on the CCP website, <clears throat> excuse me, on their green space equity mapping um, page. And you can see there's a very short paragraph here um, explaining what the tool is, why it was created and um, um, how to access it. And the first link that you notice here um, we actually have a user guide, and I'll pull that up briefly. Um, a very short couple page um, resource um, to walk through the tool, what all the, the mapping layers are, where they came from, um, how to use the various icons and, and widgets within the tool, and then some guidance on how to search within the tool and bring in extra information, um, as I'll show later on today. And then within this user guide, we also have a link to a very brief instructional video. It's about five minutes long. Um, of us doing um, a, another demo of the tool um, as a recorded resource um, for users to, to have access to as well. So when you scroll down on the web page, you can actually see the application embedded on the page itself, and this is interactive. Um, so you can click OK and access the tool straight here on straight from here on the web page, or if you want to open it on a new tab, um, so you can have complete access to it, and on a bigger screen, you can do so right here. So I'll go to the application. So when you open the tool, again, all you need is a web browser to, to access this. You'll be met with the CCP logo and a very brief welcome message. I'll click OK. And then I'll just briefly walk through the layout of the tool and all of the great um, data layers that we have in here um, for users to, to be able to access. So I will note that the layout of, of the tool, where all the text panels are, may change depending on the size of your screen. Um, you can use this on a phone, on a tablet, on any type of device. And so the, the layout might differ, but all of the same information will be included um, regardless of the, the, the um, device you're on. So on the left-hand side of my screen, um, we have some more introductory text um, on how to very briefly use the tool, um, what all of these icons are and how to use them, um, and how to begin um, using this tool to uh, perform an analysis on green space equity um, in your community. The next tab over says how to use this tool, which has, um, I believe, 11 steps um, to, again, very briefly walk you through um, what an analysis would look like using this tool, how um, some uh, suggested ways to walk through the tool and utilize it. We have pictures and screenshots here. So again, just another resource for users um, across, we say, like the GIS spectrum to be able to um, to utilize this tool and make sure that everyone has adequate access um, to the data in here. On the right side of my screen, in the upper right-hand corner, we have our data layers. And you can see these little um, check boxes next to each layer that toggles the visibility on our map. So when you turn it off, it turns off, it turns off on the map and also updates our legend, our dynamic legend at the bottom right. So the first data um, grouping category is called green spaces. And relatively self-explanatory, we have um, data layers, um, our primary data layers for open and limited access green spaces or closed or unknown access green spaces. And I'll, I'll take a moment to explain to explain those two. Um, the green spaces, that term that we're using here is supposed to be more, more all-encompassing than just parks, for example. So um, it does include very um, small local parks, private parks, um, conservation easements, everything up from state to national parks, um, and everything in between. The, the data set that's in here um, was ultimately pulled from the USGS's um, Protected Areas database, um, and they frequently update that and um, work across the country to update this data set. So it is available um, across the US, 
um, but the Chesapeake Bay program has kind of um, condensed it down to just the, the outline of the Chesapeake Bay watershed that we're looking at um, and added some more detailed information to it. And so that is the data set that's feeding the open and limited access and the closed or unknown access green spaces. And so within that data set, there's information on access. And that means um, what's available to the public? How can actual people um, use these green spaces? Open and limited access green spaces, again, relatively self-explanatory, but it means open to the public, um, open to anyone who wants to not only visit, but potentially recreate on these areas. Um, limited access gets into um, potential um, barriers to, to access um, in these green spaces, such as a fee or a cost associated with it, um, if you have to maybe drive to the, to the green space. Um, and it also refers to areas that might not be open 24-7. Um, so if there's some type of um, hours restriction on the green space, if it's, say, a national park that's only open for a couple months of the year, um, that's what's captured in this, in this grouping. And this layer is automatically turned on when you first when you first open the tool. So that's what we're seeing on our map, and you can see reflected in our legend here. And then closed or unknown access green spaces refer to um, typically privately owned areas. Um, typically, is what's captured under closed access, um, or areas that are, again are just not meant to be used by the public. And unknown is also a category as all this information was compiled if it wasn't readily. Um, clear um, what type of access the public had to the green space, um, it's captured under that unknown category. So it's still represented on the map, but we're not sure of the, the access. The next category of data layers we have um, is demographics. And we can go through um, where these data layers come from and how um, they're able to be used and visualized on our map. Primarily, all of these data layers come from EPA. Um, their EJ screen tool. If you're not familiar, is their um, environmental justice um, screening and mapping tool. It's another online um, web application um, that's very robust. It's a, it's a great resource. And so we just pulled some data layers from there um, to look at um, some of the, the higher level demographic factors across the watershed. So people of color, low income, low life expectancy, linguistically isolated, and to um, age populations over age 64 and under age five. And we also have a data layer in here from the CDC. Um, they call it their social vulnerability index, um, which is just another um, take on potentially at risk areas. Um, socially vulnerable index um, refers to things that we already have listed such as people of color and low income, but also takes into account other factors like access to a car, um, crowding in the household and, and things of that nature. So. That was another helpful resource that we wanted to, to include in here. And we also have um, helpful contextual information such, such as the boundaries for counties, census block groups, as we'll um, show in one moment, um, and congressional districts. And the census block groups, I will mention that is the, the scale that a lot of this information is available at. Um, and census block groups are si slightly smaller than census tracts. So it's, it's getting down um, to a finer grain level um, of data. And then our very last data group is called accessibility. And here we have um, data layers on um, approximately a 10 minute walk around the open and limited access green spaces, a five minute walk, and a 10 minute drive around those green spaces. And these are um, approximate, approximate distances. Um, the 10 minute walk, for example, is a half a mile around all of the green spaces. Um, the five minute walk is a quarter mile distance around them, and a 10 minute drive is five full miles around the green spaces. Um, which the rationale for including the 10 minute drive was to um, include rural areas in the analysis as um, typically sometimes these, these tools and, and green space are biased toward urban areas. And so we wanted to try to collect the, the rural areas um, and consider them as well. And then below that, we also have some, some other contextual layers that might be helpful. Total green space acres per capita, distance to the nearest transit stop, which comes from EPA and a walkability index also from EPA. Um, also just contextual layers to include, to, to really analyze the accessibility. Um, as we know, just because you might be within a half a mile of a green space doesn't mean someone can, can truly walk there. And so understanding the, the walkability of the area, the distance um, or the, the physical barriers that there might be um, to getting to the green space was um, driving the, um, the addition of these layers. 
And then in our bottom right hand corner, we have our legend, as I mentioned, that will dynamically change as you toggle these layers on and off, the legend will, will update as well. And then we also have some filter options for more um, higher level analysis, if you will, where you can filter any of the data layers in any way you see fit, and then you can actually export those um, results as a spreadsheet as well. So I will just um, get into a quick demo of how you would use this tool. So I will zoom into the Richmond area here. And as I zoom in, you can see, turn our legend back on, you can see some data layers automatically start to, to, to populate. The census blog groups are highlighted in this light blue, is this light blue outline, which again is just, they are smaller than census tracts and is the scale that a lot of the demographic information is available at. And so it's just a way to, to visualize communities and different neighborhoods. I will turn that off for now so we can see our map clearly. And another layer that turned on that you might have noticed is this light green buffer around our green spaces. That is the 10 minute walk or approximate 10 minute walk um, or half a mile distance around all of our green spaces. And so as we zoom into um, the Richmond area here, we can see not only the areas that have um, open or restricted access green spaces, but the areas that are within a half a mile of them. And maybe even more importantly, we see the areas that are not covered and those gap areas start to form. Um, the areas that are not, that do not have a green space or are not within a half a mile of one. And so this is where the analysis um, can begin using the tool. If we're curious, say, on the different populations and the demographics of the people who live in these gap areas, who isn't being served currently by a green space or um, in a half a mile with, with um, two one. So we can go under our demographics tab. And for example, we can turn on our people of color population and I'll and see it, our legend update here. So the, the, the deep red, orange and yellow areas are the highest percentiles or where the highest rates of people of color are um, on this map. And so you can see how they fill in our gap areas. The, the red, orange and yellow stand out. And so you can clearly see where um, those higher, higher percentage of people of color uh, populations are located. If we want to go to the CDC social vulnerability index, the deeper blue areas are the highest vulnerable areas according to the CDC. And so you can start to see similar patterns to what we saw with people of color. And as we go down um, our demographic layers, um, you can start to see patterns form as well. Again, looking at these gap areas that are not covered um, in green. And then lastly, I'll turn on our low life expectancy layer. Again, the deeper red areas here are where there are higher rates of lower life expectancy. And again, very similar patterns um, to the, uh, the previous layers that we noted. Um, as well that are not served by a green space or within half a mile of one. So that is how you would use the tool um, to kind of do a quick demographic analysis on who, who lives in these gap areas. Again, the, the 10 minute walk is the default distance that we're looking at, but you have a five minute walk and a 10 minute drive to analyze as well. And um, briefly, I want to go over these, these tools up in the upper left-hand corner of our map here. Um, this first tool has descriptions of all of the data layers and the data groupings that I just went through. So it's, it's in writing here to, to reference. This base map gallery, um, which can be very powerful, um, can change the, the background map that we're looking at. So if you wanna look at an aerial imagery, you have that option. We can zoom in and you can see, you know, the, the structures and the buildings and the neighborhoods and the patterns themselves on the map. The next button is also very powerful. It's our add data button. And here you can add any GIS information or any GIS data um, from any source to the tool and bring it in and view it alongside the preloaded data layers that we have as well. And in the user guide, we give um, suggested terms to search, um, data layers that you might wanna bring in. You can search the entire ArcGIS um, or um, Esri's catalog of data layers. If you have a GIS login with your organization, you can log in to that and pull in organizational um, information. Or if you have local GIS data on your computer, you can bring that in as well. Um, under file, it shows you the different file types that are accepted. Um, so you can drag and drop that into the tool as well. Or if you have a URL, um, a link to um, different GIS um, data layers, again, across, across the internet, you can bring that into the tool as well. And so for example, an example term you can search is urban heat island. 
search that and we can add that data to our map. And I'll turn off our 10 minute walk so we can view that. And so you can see um, what that will look like alongside the data layers already within the tool, how those patterns match up. And then viewing that alongside any demographic information or additional information um, you would see fit. And then the last tool I'll highlight that kind of brings all of these, all of these tools together is the print, the print tool. So not only can you export a lot of the data that we're viewing um, in a tabular format in a spreadsheet, you can also print um, various maps as this tool loads and might not load. Um, my internet might not be supported in this, but basically it allows you to print any view of the map that you have with any of the data layers turned on into any file type that you might need. Um, the default is a PDF, um, but you can export and print any um, file types um, that you need. Um, and so you can always you know, take a screenshot of the tool, but this print tool um, will um, allow you to download a higher resolution um, map um, from the tool. So that is a very, very, very high level overview of, of the tool, um, all of the data layers that are visible within it. Um, and again, the various resources that are available. Um, again, the, that user guide and that demo video um, that goes through a very similar um, walkthrough of the tool and example for how to use it. So that, that is all, that's all for me. Thank you so much, Bianca. We actually had two questions come in that I'll go ahead and read. Um, the first one said, when I opened the tool, I received a notice that the layer impervious surfaces and structures, water and wetlands, tree canopy cannot be added to the map. Could you please advise? Absolutely, that layer, thank you for bringing that up. That layer will appear under the green spaces category um, and the link is just broken. And so we need to fix the link, but um, that will allow you to add information on, like you said, tree canopy, impervious surface and structures and water and wetlands. And so that is um, a higher resolution um, land cover and land use data set. And so once we fix that link, um, that message will not appear anymore. And those layers will be op um, options out of the green space um, group. Thank you for, for bringing that up. The next question is, are unprotected or unmanaged green spaces also shown on the map or does it only show those green spaces that are protected for that purpose? Great question. I believe it's only protected areas. Um, again, the, the source data is from the, the USGS's protected areas database. And so um, how they define protected areas um, was it driving how they collected that, that information, again, across the country, across state agencies and different organizations. And so they do have areas, again, that are not um, meant to be used by people, not meant to be recreated on, and they have them identified as such, but I believe it's um, areas that are protected in, in some way, shape, or form. And we had one other question come in. Is there a way to turn down the opacity of the green space and access areas to better see the area underneath? Yes, another great question. These three dots um, on the right-hand side of each of the data layers gives you um, some additional options. So under transparency is where you would toggle the, the opacity there. Um, and while I'm here, one other thing I wanted to note was each layer, every single layer within the tool has um, pop-up information. Everything is interactive in the tool. So if you wanna click on a green space, it gives you a very brief um, uh, look at the name, the ownership, the access type as well. And so you can, like I said, export this information um, in a spreadsheet, but you can also click um, and view some, some pop-up information as well. And so to view that in the table, you will go to view an attribute table. Um, but yes, this additional menu is where you can toggle um, the visibility and transparency. And we had one other question come in and then I'm gonna just ask folks to hold any other questions uh, until the end of the presentation so we can move on to Phyllis. And that question is, can you pull up the urban heat island data again and talk about how you could potentially use the overlays to help inform decisions? I saw that some of the hot spots on a heat island map did coincide with where the green spaces exist and some areas where they didn't. What does that tell us? Another great question. And it's, it's I will say, I won't speak um, in general terms. It does maybe depend on the type of analysis or, or type of questions that you're trying to answer. Um, but it absolutely um, does beg the question, where are the impervious surfaces? And once we fix that link, 
you'll be able to view them. Where are those impervious surfaces? Where are the opportunities to green those areas? And I know Richmond, and based on this example, is doing um, work to um, to green previous areas that have impervious surface. Um, where are there options to plant more trees and provide more um, tree canopy and shade? Um, and where do they coincide with the green spaces? Um, are the green spaces serving the function that they're, they're supposed to be? Um, if you notice hotspots where um, the green spaces are located or where there's parks um, and they're in a hotspot, that, that begs the question to do more analysis and a, a better, get a better understanding of what's going on in those green areas um, to see if they're serving the purpose that they're meant to be. I hope that answers that, that question. All right, thank you so much, Bianca. And if you wouldn't mind just staying on at the end, we will answer the rest of these. And in the meantime, I'll just ask you to go ahead and stop sharing and we will turn it over to Phyllis. Rachel, are you still good to present? The yep, slide? I am ready to go when you are. All right, well, thank you for having me. I'm excited because I love talking about what Neighbor Spades does. So, um, my name is Phyllis Torres. I'm the executive director at Neighbor Space of Baltimore County, and my email and phone number are there in case you have questions after, after this session. Next slide. So um, just some quick facts. Oh, creep. Yep, there we go. Thanks. We are a land trust, which means we're a nonprofit that um, works to permanently conserve land. We do have a very specific service area where we work. Um, so we work in Baltimore County, but only inside the urban rural demarcation line. It's kind of hard to see on this map. I know it's really small, but it's that black line um, that sort of squiggles around the beltway. So as you can see, our, our sites are the, the blue dots. Those are all inside that black line. Um, it's basically the Ertl as we call it, is basically the city's growth boundary. So it divides the county, Baltimore County, into an urban and a rural zone. Um, on the one hand, to protect the resources in the rural area, agriculture, um, drinking water, and then to drive growth and development inside the hurdle. So we have 21 sites right now. 19 of those are public, open to the public for a total of 100 acres. Um, they're a mix of properties that we own in fee and conservation easements that we have on other owners' property. Eight of our sites are improved with green infrastructure, and then we have several others that are in different stages of design and construction. Organizationally, we have three part-time staff and 10 board members. Next slide. Our mission is to enhance the livability of communities inside the Ertl, and we do that by protecting and improving land for small parks, gardens, trails, and natural areas. So this is a little bit of a broader mission than most um, more traditional land trusts, and I will get back to that later on. I do want to explain briefly what we mean when we talk about livability. Next slide. So it's basically the sum of factors that add up to a community's quality of life. Those fall into three broad categories, environmental, social, um, economic. You could make a whole long list of factors for each of these, but um, I put some examples on this slide. So environmental, air and water quality obviously affects a community's quality of life. Socially, community pride, cohesiveness, um, and then economic factors. An example there would be the property values in the neighborhood. Next slide. So I wanted to illustrate what, um, why we focus on that area inside the Ertl. It's probably no surprise that in this more urban setting, um, there's a bunch of challenges. I'll go through a few in the next two slides. Neighbor Space does believe that this is the area that needs needs it the most, that is most in need of green space. And um, that is something that we as a land trust can help address. So one of the issues, and this ties into what Bianca already showed us, um, is a lack of access to open space. So at Neighbor Space, we usually use a quarter mile as a benchmark because we believe that everyone should be able to access green space within a five minute walk. And I did see that that was an option on the green space equity mapper. Um, but so here I've taken a half mile since that seems to be the default in the other model as well. So this was prepared for us by our GIS consultant, Sarah Young. 
he um, has mapped it out. So here, this is in the purple, yellow, and orange. These are the dwelling units who do not have access to open space within a half mile walk. So you'll see that's almost half of all the dwelling units inside the Ertl. The Ertl here is that green, green line. Um, so that's a lot of people who cannot walk to open space within you know, roughly 10 minutes. Next slide. Even if you could, if you, even if in theory, you could walk to an, a green space within 10 minutes, um, Bianca alluded to this already, you probably can't because your neighborhood is not walkable. So yellow and orange dots here are neighborhoods that are car dependent. And as you can tell, all the neighborhoods inside the Ertl are car dependent. Next slide. Then environmentally, we have a lot of pollution inside the Ertl. So these um, are the different watersheds in Baltimore County. The ones that are orange are the healthy ones. Um, all others are impaired either, either by nutrients or sediment. And so you can see all the watersheds inside the Ertl are impaired for one or the other or both. Next slide. And pollution is not distributed equally. So Baltimore County had a study done. Um, unfortunately, it's been since 2011 and they haven't repeated this. Um, so this is an old map, but they did a study to assess the effects of environmental justice, um, specifically related to water quality in Baltimore County. So the yellow and red communities here are the ones that are at, at medium or high risk for environmental justice conditions related to water quality. And again, as you can see, most of these fall inside the Ertl. Next slide. I don't think this is a surprise either. So um, Baltimore County does struggle with low home values in comparison to other, uh, other counties in the area. And I'm pretty sure that if we would restrict this to just inside the Ertl, that black line would be even lower on the scale. So that's an economic challenge that our communities face. Next slide. So those are some of the livability issues that um, our communities in our service area face. What do we do to address this? So we conserve land, which is typical. It's the definition of, of a land trust. Um, different from I would say the more, you know, a lot of people when they think of a land trust think of a rural um, land trust different from how most rural land trusts go about that is that we do actually acquire a lot of our properties in fee, which means that we are the owner. So we have our properties are about half and half a mix of, of conservation easements and um, in fee properties. So that's different. And then what sets us apart, I think most is what we do with that land after we've acquired it. So in an urban setting, it's not enough, at least in my opinion, it's not enough to simply conserve it. These lots often, it's we're often talking about a vacant lot that hasn't been maintained for years. So there's work to do um, before it's environmentally healthy, a lot of work. And then also for that land to address the, to enhance the livability of that surrounding community, which is our mission, um, it needs to be restored, needs to fit the meet the needs of the surrounding community and then stewarded. So a land trust owns its property, conserves its property in perpetuity. So um, we are responsible for stewarding that land forever. And then this whole process is community driven every single step of the way. Um, next slide. So I could I could explain that process to you in theory. I think it'll be more fun and easier to understand if I just walk you through an example. So this is an aerial photo of our latest, our, our baby. This is the latest park that was added to the neighbor space family. It's called Chestnut Park um, and it's located in Dundalk in Turner Station. Next slide. So some of you might be familiar with Turner Station. This is, again, an aerial photo of um, at least part of the neighborhood. So it is it is one of the oldest and largest African-American communities in Baltimore County. Um, so it was way back in the late 1800s, it was farmland owned by a certain Mr. Turner, which is where the name comes from. And then during the Great Migration, African-Americans flocked to the area to work at Bethlehem Steel, which was located in Sparrows Point which is right next to Turner Station. So on in this picture here, if you're looking at your screen, Sparrows Point is on the right. Um, on the left, we have Bear Creek. 
in, you can see in the distance, there's the I-695 going over top, and then across the water is Gray's Landfill. So I probably don't need to tell you that environmentally, Turner Station is um, located in a really tough spot. So um, after Bethlehem Steel shut down, um, population declined, poverty rose, there is a lot more rental properties that there used to be. So community cohes cohesiveness has also um, taken a hit. It is a food desert, desert. There's not, I was told by one of the residents that she thought she would have to take three buses in order to get to the gro um, closest grocery store. Right now, all that's there is a Dollar Tree on the corner. Um, so it's, you know, a lot of those challenges that other communities inside the Ertl face as well. There is a very active improvement association. Turner Station Conservation Teams was founded in 2006 and they have been working very, very hard ever since together with Baltimore County government, local nonprofits like us to revitalize the neighborhood. Next slide. So um, Turner Station Conservation Teams contacted us in 2019 with the request that we consider conserving this lot that's this that red triangle here. So it's located in between Dundalk Avenue, which is a fairly busy street, and then um, an alley behind a quieter neighborhood street. It's about half an acre, um, pretty small, but as our sites go, vacant, uh, vacant lots in urban communities, that's a pretty good size. And it had been for sale for years. The community wanted to turn it into a pocket park. So first thing we do is in this case, yes, we did think we would have be able to um, afford the purchase. And then the next thing we do is run our GIS analysis. Next slide. So we do actually have our own GIS tool. Again, that Thayer Young put together for us a few years ago. So it, it's based on those factors of livability that I mentioned earlier. Um, that affect the well-being, quality of life in our communities. So you'll see it's those same three categories, social, environmental, and economic. We have goals and objectives for each of those. And then um, next slide. Similar to what, what CECO did was um, we identified criteria, on the ground criteria that measure how well, that would could measure how well a site addresses these objectives and goals. Um, and then we had stakeholders rank them. So stakeholders prioritized the goals, the objectives, um, and the criteria, criteria used to meet those. And that, that's why in this, in this pie chart, we don't have four quarters. They're all, each wedge is a little bit of a different size. So you'll see conservation ranked very high um, according to the stakeholder feedback and then restoration as well, social would be the second largest, second highest priority. The reason here, I don't want to go into too much detail, but the reason here that we have those environmental goals, that environmental goals split into restoration and conservation is because they're often at odds when you're looking at a certain lot. Um, so if I'm looking at a vacant lot that it is wooded, that one will store, score high for conservation, um, but low for restoration because there really isn't much opportunity to restore is already a healthy and um, environment. And then other way around, if you're looking at a vacant lot that's you know lawn or even concrete, that will score high for restoration because there's a high potential there to restore that to an environmentally healthy lot and low on conservation because there's not much to conserve. And both of those types of lots are lots that we're interested in that we want to conserve that could help address our mission. Um, so we do, we don't want those to cancel each other out. So we pulled that into two different categories. Next slide. So this is what that looks like for that lot that I just showed you that's now Chestnut Park. So we have the purple, I know it's really small, um, Green and brown are the environmental goals. Purple is the social goal and pink is the economic. I do want to say the GIS tool is a tool. You do still need a human to look at that and make sense of, of the results. And so here it looks like for some of these maps, um, the parcel doesn't score 
very high. And that is because of, um, for example, in the in the purple one, the social goal, it doesn't score, it isn't colored quite as dark as the, the surrounding parcels. And that's simply because it's not a residential lot. Um, and so one of these, one of these indicators, one of these criteria then won't score it. So you still, you know, you still need a human to go in and look at each of these maps and make sense of them. But so this, this lot did score high in our GIS tool. Next, next slide. So then we've um, responded to the community. We've run our GIS analysis, decided that, yes, we would like to move forward purchasing this lot. Next thing we do is hire a contractor to perform an environmental site assessment. This is a pretty basic, it's pretty, it's basically a check um, for hazardous materials. It came, site came clean through that. Then we look at establishing a management agreement. So part of our model is that we only acquire a property if there is an on the ground stewardship partner who's willing to take care of that lot. Um, it's usually a community organization. So here, Turner Station Conservation Teams reached out to us. They are our stewardship partner. Um, they're a very strong partner, well organized, have been around for a while, are able to rally volunteers. So that's really a wonderful partner. So we sign, we draw up a maintenance management agreement that both parties sign, and then we were able to purchase the lot. Next slide. So this is what our lots usually look like <laughs> once we've acquired them. So there's a, a, you know, you can see on the right, there's lots of dead trees usually, or trees that are completely overgrown by English ivy, other invasive vines. Um, Lots of invasives on the ground, shrubs, perennials. It's they're usually, usually a bit of a mess. Next slide. So we bring in a huge dumpster. Um, next slide. And a bunch of volunteers. These are some of the neighbors who cleaned up that morning. Next slide. And then you're, it, this is not the best photo, but um, this is what it looked like after cleaning up. So you can see it has a nice big lawn area in the center, um, nice and shaded, which is huge because I'm sure if you would use the, um, the mapping tool that Bianca just demonstrated, you would see that this community suffers from heat islands in the summer um, and quite a bit of flooding, flooding as well. So next slide. So it's cleaned up. Now we get to the iterative step of drawing up a design. So this, this really is iterative. So we go back and forth between surveying the community, getting input through meetings, charrettes on what the community would like to see at the site. And um, a landscape architect or landscape architecture students who draw draft designs based on that input. So we'll have some meetings and charrettes um, get an idea of what the community would like to see. Someone, a landscape architect, will draft a design. We go back, we get feedback, and it goes back and forth a few times like that. Next slide. So we do want each of, this is the design, the final design for, for the site of Chestnut Park. We do always keep our mission in mind. So we have community meetings collect input to address those, those social um, social objectives that we're looking to meet. And then of course, we need to make sure that we're addressing those environmental objectives. So here you'll see those green circles are um, design elements that address the environmental needs. So there's a meadow, a pollinator garden, a basecape and a rain garden um, to help collect and filter water. And then the yellow circles are those, those social design elements. There's usually, most of our sites, um, neighbors want you know a lawn for, for kids to play, um, a pavilion or some sort of central gathering area for um, neighbors to get together. And Turner Station also wanted a community garden because they used to grow vegetables and fruit on this lot, let's say about 50 years ago. And then um, they also have a tradition of playing horseshoe. We actually found an old horseshoe while cleaning up the park. So they would like to have a horseshoe pit as well. Next slide. 
So this is kind of our general restoration progress, uh, restoration process. We've already done the cleanup. We have the final design. Next up is finding funding to construct the design. This is can be quite a challenge um, and something that's not on, well, we usually have to cobble together funds from multiple different sources. That's just the way it is. It's often also the case that we are able to find grants to fund the green infrastructure. So those design elements that are um, that address the environmental goals and objectives, it's much harder to fund what we call grayscape. So for this for this project, for instance, we found a grant that would fund construction of the gardens, the meadow, um, basecape, rain garden, woodland garden, all of that. It would not cover construction of the trail. We were able to cobble together funds from a number of sources for that. Um, we do not have funds still for a pavilion, benches, the community garden, the horseshoe pit. So we're still looking for that. Next slide. So on the left here is the contractor at work constructing the garden. And then on the right, we had a picture. Um, I swear there were volunteers out there that day to help with planting. So that's something, a step we usually do together with the community to get neighbors involved. It's a lot of people enjoy planting. Next slide. Apologies, there was a picture. I don't know what happened. Oh, <laughs> no worries. Oh, there you go. Oh, there you go. It's fading in. All right. Yes, those are some neighbor, neighbors, space volunteers, and um, community members planting. So once we've, the park is restored now, that's great. As I mentioned, we are responsible for stewardship in perpetuity together with our community partner. So we have this management agreement in place. Neighbor space, this is fairly new, but I'm hoping going forward for every park to draw up a maintenance manual um, that kind of details, you know, when to water, when to weed, how to do that, a list with resources um, for volunteers and funds. Then training, this is not very formal, but we host multiple maintenance events with our neighbors throughout the first two or three years um, to kind of, you know, demonstrate what's in that maintenance manual and show um, how to take care of that space together while we also work in the park. And then the hope is that eventually that the community has the knowledge and the tools it needs to independently take care of, of the space. Neighbor space will always be there for support and we are required to monitor annually. With our spaces, we are there a lot more than, than once a year. Next slide. And then comes the fun part. So. The park is almost completed in this picture. This is quite sad. I always have a lot of pictures of the construction process, and then I completely forget to take pictures um, of the finished product. So this, it's almost completed here. It actually is a really pretty spot. And then we get to host a ribbon cutting ceremony with the com community. Um, we had a little girl when we opened the park in September, we had a little girl who popped up and grabbed the big scissors and decided she was going to cut the ribbon. So next generation um, open the park for us. Next slide. So Phyllis, we have a couple of questions oh, that have come in. Okay. Would you like to stop and take those? And then if we have time, we can move on to the other sites. Yes, let's do that because in all honesty, I tucked these slides in because I love bragging about all our spaces, but sure. I didn't think I would have time to. So yes, let's address questions first. Absolutely. So the first question is, can Maryland's program open space help fund the other components of this project? Aha. Uh -huh. um, I love that question. I was just in Annapolis on Friday test to provide testimony to hopefully designate some of those program open space funds for, um, for the work that we do. So there is that's a good question. I honestly, if if whoever asked the question knows more, I would love to hear it. We have not um, received funds directly from program open space for this kind of work. So it's usually there are some other grants out there that are more focused on, you know, community work um, that that I could look to. Baltimore County will also help us often with this kind of project. But that's a good question. Um, I can amplify that, Phyllis, if you like. This is John Griffin. The bill that <clears throat> that Phyllis is referring to is a proposed what's called green space equity uh, a bill, and it provides funding from the state, if you will, state share of program open space uh, to purchase land and improve it for public use in in underserved and uh, overburdened communities in the state. So 
uh, this this grant program, if it passes in the legislature, could clearly provide a grant to Baltimore Green Space to purchase this property and improve it for public use. Thank you, John. Yeah. Sure, not at all. Right. Uh, the next question is, what strategies do you use to gather stakeholder input when doing the prioritization for the site assessment? Um, so I full disclosure, I, I've only been ED here since October. So this process was done way before my time at Neighbor Space. But um, judging from our files, it looks like it was a mix. So we had some surveys um, sent out for electronic and, and paper. And I'm assuming and this I you know don't know for sure, but I think also conversations because we often struggle with surveys, whether they're paper or online, we often don't get a very good response rate, especially from community members. So I think it was a mix of, of conversations and, um, and surveys. And the next question is, is neighbor space ever able to financially support the community stewards to do that maintenance or stewardship work? Is that something you'd look to do in the future? That is such, that's so. I will say our stu you know maintenance is a struggle. Um, there is a lot. Definitely, the first three years. If anyone here has a garden at home, you know that those first three years, there's a lot of time that goes into it for weeding and watering. Um, at Chestnut Park, for instance, we planted seven native trees. That's a lot of trees when those need to be watered, and um, trees need gallons and gallons of water, you know, weekly in their first few months or growing seasons. So you're asking community volunteers, that's a lot, that's a big ask. And then, you know, asking them to come out at least to the events and preferably in between to do some weeding, mulching, that kind of thing. I think it is a big ask and I think it's too big of an ask to just assume that people have, you know, give give of their time freely. So that is another reason that I'm very interested in this bill that John just um, gave a little more detail on because it provide funds for stewardship. So we really struggle with that. It's e relatively easy to find funding for, for new projects. You know, that's exciting. It looks good. You're making a, an immediate environmental and social impact. Finding funds for the stewardship, the maintenance, that's really difficult. And there really isn't there isn't a source I can point to right now for that. So that, again, this bill that we testified in favor of on Friday would, would help address that. So right now we have, we do try to put, um, include stipends when we request grants. So for instance, this project in Chestnut Park, I did not receive, we did not receive the requested funding for um, stipends for volunteers with that grant, but I was able to get a grant specifically for the trees that did include a stipend for watering. And then neighbor space, we, um, use some of our cash on hand to also pay that volunteer's water bill. So it's kind of a mix. Um, it's not, as you know, the stipend is tiny. We were talking like $15, one five, $15 um, a month. So it's really not a lot. Um, I wish it were more, but yes, I am hoping that, that, that we, that I think there's more awareness to this issue that urban land trust specifically deal with. Well, Phyllis, thank you so much. Um, we have about three other questions that came in and they are actually for um, uh, John and Bianca. So while I ask them, I am just gonna go slowly through the rest of your slides so folks can see these other neighborhood space sites, um, if that's okay with you. And then I'll, I'll invite John and Bianca to come back on screen to answer these last few questions. Great, thank you, Rachel. So the first question is back to the green space equity mapper. Is any green space that has operating hours not open 24-7 classified as restricted rather than open? Right. Great question. And I pulled up the, the definitions from USGS while, while Phyllis was going, so I would have an answer. The open spaces require no special requirements for public access, and that may include regular hours of availability. Um, and they define restricted as either you need a special permit, a registration permit or highly var variable times um, open to use. So again, that's more seasonal, large chunks of time that are um, um, where you can't access them. Great, thank you, Bianca. The next question is for functionality issues or requests for help, who would be the best person to reach out to? So John, your email and Lewis's email are actually located on, our, on that webpage. Right. Um, so right. I think that would be the best. Yes, agreed. 
And if if we can't answer it, we'll always catch up with Bianca. <laughs> so. And the last question, following from the question prior about what green spaces are currently shown, does the Chesapeake Conservation Partnership anticipate adding to the layer over time from beyond USGS protected spaces data? Yes, and as a matter of fact, even on this map, or Bianca checked me on this, but I think we did find out that some local parks and other green spaces were not in the protected lands database, but we added them. Is that not right? Absolutely. And when we were finishing developing this, the USGS, I believe, had just released their newest version. So um, I, I, there is going to be an effort, at least annually, to, to check um, those sources to see if there's an update. And like John said, to, to ground truth it and see if there's anything missing as well. Right. I would just urge all of you to use this, um, but you're going to need to do some ground truthing, you know, just because of um, highways, roads, you name it, that may not show up on these maps. Um, <clears throat> and for those of you from Maryland, um, you might be familiar with the uh, with the uh, Department of Natural Resources Park Equity Mapper. And one of the people on the advisory committee was from the University of Maryland College Park. John Michael Archer, who had developed that. And so you'll see a lot of similar layers here so that any of you can look at the baseline and then add in uh, other layers here, uh, like the park equity mapper in Maryland. Well, I want to thank each one of our speakers today. Um, the slide I have right now are some resources that we've put together, including all the links that you've seen today. And we will be emailing this out after the, the webinar. And just also wanted to share the information for Bianca, John, and Phyllis. Thank you so much to the three of you. And I hope everybody has a wonderful day. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.